Hey there, my name is AJ Pickett and I make videos about role playing games and lots of them. I upload twice a week with a live stream every weekend. You can also find me on Subscribestar, Patreon and Discord, Facebook and Twitter, links down below. Also, there's an option to join the channel as a member and I welcome any questions you have in the comments section down below. As always, if you like this video or this channel, hit that like button and subscribe if you would be so kind. Another planner race today. These ones have been mentioned by me many times on this channel. They really, really need more of a spotlight in official game material. For instance, there's no mention of them in 3.5 edition's manual of the planes at all. So let's shine a spotlight on the remarkable Rilmani and take a little wander over to the center of the multiverse, the infinite disk of land that is called by some the concordant plane of the Outlands, home to the impossible spire and the infamous city of doors named Sigil. As much as the fabled location on Toral called Candlekeep is a bastion of lore and mysteries, there are locations that make it look like the stack of old magazines in a dentist's office. On the welcome page of the foremost wiki on Planescape, the very first words are, in the centre of the great Wilmani city named Sum of All, a building of strange angles stands, obviously not of Wilmani construction. Ancient even amongst their number, the mirrored library once known as Timaresh, holds untold amounts of lore from across the multiverse. Big shout out to the lore keepers of Timurash Wiki. Amazing work, guys. The real Marni are a race of neutrality. This is the reason that not many beings of the Prime Material Plane pay them much interest. While they are an ancient race, uh, they were one of the signatory races involved in the Drayden Accord, for instance, they are relatively new to the scene from a multiversal point of view. Before the Rulmani came to dominate the Outlands, the plane was populated by the Mirror Empire of Kameril, which were more passive in their neutral stance than the Rulmani are. Kameril look like short, white-skinned humans with slightly pointed teeth. They have long shocks of white hair in which they weave greenery and flowers. They favour clothing in blue, green or white and carry short bladed weapons and light crossbows with moderate enchantments on them. Chimeral are actually a lot more human in many ways, physically at least. However, they are a planner race of a type called exemplars. In this case, the pure passive aspect of neutrality. So they were very much minding their own business and have a firm stance of if you don't bother me, I won't bother you. This manifested as fairly extreme xenophobia, where they just ignored the growing presence of other planar races and the petitioners arriving to the outer planes from the Prime Material Plane. The Chimeral developed a type of mirror magic that could function in planar anti-magic zones, such as the extremely strong effect in the center of the Outlands that gets weaker as you travel hundreds and hundreds of miles away from the central spire. They sacrificed higher level spell slots to have much larger numbers of first level spell slots because lower level spells are the last magics to go as you get closer to the spire. Long ago, one pretty unusual Chimeral named Helenok believed that the race's detachment could lead to their downfall, so she created a way to spy on other races unobtrusively. She created a device that would copy any book that was ever written anywhere in the plains. As long as it was of ample length and its author wished it to be read, she housed the ever-increasing number of books in an infinite recursive mirrored library. Naturally, the xenophobic other Chimeral learned of this and slew Helenok in disgust, but they did not dare to enter the library, naming it Timaresh, a collection of hated lore, preferring to simply set up guardians so that it would never again be used. Eventually, the Rilmani appeared and discovered the wondrous library, attempting to gain access to better serve the balance. They were wholly ignored by the Chimeral and began to use force. A war began and the Rilmani quickly gained the upper hand on the Chimeral who were utterly unprepared for any relation with other races, including warlike ones. The Chimeral fled to the mirror plane of their own creation, abandoning the hated library and their ancient home to the Rilmani conquerors. The mirror plane is a quasi-realm that existed only where a mirror or other reflective surface cast a reflection, and only when another being looked into that reflected surface to actually see the reflection. Thus, the Chimeral only exist when they are being um, even unwittingly observed. To the xenophobic race, this is truly horrifying, and they are unable to escape, so they have quickly gone mad. Although they did learn to hide themselves so that they would appear only as brief flickers in the corner of a mirror's gazer's eye. Rilmani are a distinctive looking humanoid race that have metallic appearance to their skin and opaque eyes with a rainbow sheen to them as though they were coated in a thin slick of oil. They have sub-races that are divided into different metallic traits and have distinctive appearances and powers of their own. They grow hair on the back and sides of their head and are capable of growing facial hair. 
A line of pointed ridges run from the brow to halfway up the front of the cranium. These are cartilaginous lumps, not bone or horns. They generally have small eyes which emit a faint light and have long narrow faces, heads larger than a human in proportion to their body. Their arms and legs tend to be thinner with smaller hands proportionate to a human. They are a race that favours finely tailored and somewhat elaborate clothing, particularly hats, and many people mistakenly think they have two sets of antenna on their head, thanks to an extremely common fashion trait in the features of their hats. While they are humanoid, they are very much a planar species with very different traits. For instance, their minds are extremely difficult for telepaths and mind mages to infiltrate. They are also resistant to any enchantments and their alignment can never be altered via magical means. They are just supernaturally stubborn, and once their mind is made up on something, they are implacable, inflexible, uncompromising, which some might confuse with lawful behaviour, but mostly it's just that they pay no heed to other races' opinions, which can be infuriating. Rulmali are also a society of beings who grow to adulthood at the age of 50 and then simply cease ageing. So if you thought elves take a while to ruminate on anything before taking action, the Rulmani would consider elves to be almost rash and reckless in comparison to how their society operates. The same is not true of their emotions though, the Rulmani can be swiftly annoyed by other races, and if they deem it necessary to kill a non-Rulmani, they'll do so without regret, but they'll always have a reason for doing this though. Rulmani do not kill for pleasure. They'll bleat the shit out of someone who ticks them off with some satisfaction however. They have a 60 foot dark vision and have a high degree of tolerance for effects that would physically alter them against their will. They're kind of just inert. As a result of this, they have advantage on all saving throws versus psychic effects that are immune to fire and cold based damage, either mundane or magical, and take half damage and effects from lightning and poison. They don't have any particular resistance to physical strikes inflicting piercing, slashing, or bludgeoning damage, though it varies with the type of Rulmani we're talking about. Rulmani have a talent for languages, they speak their own language and the common tongue of the plains, and they're quick to adapt and learn common and undercommon of any world that they visit, otherwise they can use telepathy with a 60 foot range to communicate with those that have a language or communicate empathically with creatures and animals with no language of their own. Due to living in proximity to the magic and divine power dampening central spire of the Outlands, Romani cannot be summoned to the Prime Material Plane. Only in very rare situations are there exceptions to this. The Romani who are away from the outlines on the Outer Plains can possibly be summoned, such as the incident in Watcher's Keep in the late 14th century DR on Toril. With members of their race never dying of old age, there's basically no such thing as workplace progression in any particular career. There's no election of officials or representative. Theirs is a truly democratic society where each individual has a say in anything they're involved in that affects their life. This would be a paralytic state of affairs in any large civilization, so the Romani prefer to live in a great number of small communities, with only a few dozen or less members. There is zero shortage of real estate in the Outlands, so no matter how many Rulmani exist, there is ample space for them to form small settlements a discrete distance from each other. There are many exceptions to this, of course, one of which is their most densely populated city, called Sum of All. Sum of All spans a full mile across in every direction and holds tens of thousands of Rulmani within its expertly crafted buildings that feature pearl-laced domes and stunning masonry studded with precious gems mined from the base of the spire itself. Due to being so close to the spire, some of all is a magic free zone, apart from one extremely well guarded secret portal that connects to the transitive plane of the infinite staircase, which the Lelendi, native of this staircase, are on the only other race who know that exists and where it is, though it's rumoured some members of the Plains Workers Guild are also aware of the portal. This portal is unlike any other doorway on the staircase, that much has to be true. I suspect that it exists via the mirror magic of the ancient Carmeral, and it is this doorway as well as the Library of Timresh, which is the reason the city exists and is forbidden to all outsiders, except those who the Rulmani have complete trust in, and absolutely nobody but the Rulmani are permitted to entry to the mirror library or the stairway ever. The city is also the meeting place for the Kokordanak and once in a century gathering of all Rilmani who are able to attend and discuss the state of things, and determine what the most pressing concerns to the balance appear to be within the multiverse, and what they plan to do about it. Rilmani subraces make up the social strata of their civilization, which is, as you would expect, uniformly the same wherever you happen to find them. They don't have local customs or regional traditions, they also don't have any other government or organizing institutions. 
They object to the very idea of any real Marnie above or below any other, with the exception being their racial castes. The most common kind of ruled Marnie by far are the Plumac. Their primary concern is keeping the balance within the plane of Outland itself, and basically nothing happens there without them being aware of it. However, if something else does go down, they almost always just report it to the other Rule Money casts and wait for instructions, hoping to be left out of it entirely if possible. They are 5 feet tall and stocky, their legs are more heavy than other types of Rule Money, and they're pretty strong and have metallic, dull grey skin, resembling lead, which is why they have the name Plumac, the Latin name for lead is Plumbum. When not generally snooping on current events, the Plumac serve as the backbone of Rulmani society. They are the builders and gardeners of their lands, as well as the reluctant merchants. They don't want to interact with outsiders at all, but if you visit the stalls, caravans and shops, they will engage in trade, as this is one of the main ways to learn exactly what's happening in the land around them, making conversation with customers. The Rulmani themselves require very little. They don't really need to eat. The weather doesn't bother them at all, so they have no real need for clothing, and they could sleep out in the wild if they really wanted to, but they just have a preference for clothing and very nice dwellings, meeting places and storage venues. The Plumac keep reasonably busy when not crafting clothing and constructing buildings ever so often. They like to express their sense of balance by landscaping and planting trees and placing rocks, which enhance the beauty of the wild. The closer they get their gardens looking like untouched wilderness that just happens to be very lush, calm and comfortable, the better. Like most Rulmani, the Plumac are astoundingly stubborn and they do not like anyone just wandering up to them and talking to them. They consider it rude. Plumac live all over Outland which looks a lot like the prime material plane worlds like Toril and Earth, except the mountain ranges are a lot more sharp, the hills are a little bit steeper, ravines are a bit more jagged, cliff faces are a bit more sheer, thanks to a lack of erosion. There are plenty of ancient forests and lush meadows, some quite large, but size is deceptive and distances travelled can vary, even when travelling to exactly the same direction and exactly the same destination. The land, as the native planners call it, is like the TARDIS from Doctor Who. It has an edge, which is where it seems to loosely border all the other outer planes, manifesting as the so-called border towns, and yet the interior property of the land, all the way to the spire in the middle, which is visible from any one direction on the land, is infinite. If you need a big stretch of empty and primal wilderness, you just travel until you reach it. Basically, in Outland, worry about the destination, not the distance, and pack plenty of provisions, just in case. The next sub-race cast is the Ferumac, named after Ferum, the Latin word for iron. Their role as military enforcers of cosmic balance is obvious, and they look quite formidable compared to the rotund little Plumax. The comparison of worker ants versus soldier ants is quite apt. Ferumac stand 6.5 feet tall with thick skin, dense musculature and thick arms. They are soldiers, stoic, broad-shouldered, almost never seen without their thick suits of plate armour which they blacken in the forging process and decorate with many spikes. Their bodies look to be almost solid masses of muscle, their skin an iron grey of almost the same hue as their armour. Ferramax move with a complete lack of grace. They seem to have little need for it, resorting to brute force and head-on confrontation to achieve their goals. They are normally accompanied by very well-trained mounts, either a phantom steed or a kuldurath, which is a massive, hornless, rhino-sized creature of the Outer Plains with seriously intimidating teeth, tusks, claws, and lots of agility that can release an aura of electricity. The Rulmani clad these beasts in plate armour, which, even with the massive metal, doesn't stop them climbing up and over fortifications. Ferramax live apart from the other Rulmani, dwelling in massive grey fortresses and towers spotted around the spire, where they train and wait for assignments while keeping a constant watch over Rulmani territory and outland. Every so often they will slam open the gates of the fortifications and ride out to battle for balance in the multiverse, which makes for quite a sight as they are a formidable fighting force, the exact capabilities of which is not very well understood. I think it is safe to say though that when the Ferramax suddenly arrive at full charge, it's not a sight that any sane creature in the multiverse would welcome. Of all the real Marty, the Ferramax come closest to tipping over the, into lawfulness, but they work to remain adaptable enough to keep from falling fully into that outlook, cultivating individuality and quirks and steadfastly working to prevent any sort of hierarchy of command from emerging in their ranks. They are all great warriors who work together, but none of them is considered the leader of all. Each of them would be a leader in a task they individually excel at. 
So be particularly wary of a Feromac who uses an unusual weapon, because the chances are it's one of the foremost masters of that weapon's use in the multiverse, and you don't really want to be on the receiving end of a lesson in its capabilities. Otherwise, they most commonly use weapons such as halberds, flails, and axes. While fighting in the outer planes, the Feromac don't often bother disguising who they are unless doing so would further advance their mission, but when they arrive on the Prime Material plane they almost always polymorph themselves and their mounts to appear exactly like those on the side they are aiding in battle, revealing their true natures only if deemed absolutely necessary for their goals. Feromac often work alongside Kuprilax, who are regarded as equals on the battlefield despite their very different approaches. Feromac facing a situation that is better solved with stealth will call in the Kuprilax and vice versa. Feromax will follow the orders of Argonax and Uramax without hesitation. In older editions of D&D, the Feromax had access to innate spell-like abilities that are the same as the spells such as Blur, Command, Comprehend Languages, Light, Cure Moderate Wounds, Darkness, Detect Evil and Good, Detect Magic, Detect Thoughts, Dispel Magic, Featherfall, Hold Monster, Ice Storm, Fog Cloud, Phantom Steed, Polymorph, Sanctuary, Sea Invisibility, Silence, Teleport, and Tongues. Next up, the dangerous Cuprilac, named after Cuprum, the Latin word for copper. Their role among the Rilmani encompasses espionage, assassination, and tactical advisor positions where they work closely with the Feromac. They have a reputation for moving swiftly through the shadows and striking extremely hard in the enemy's most vulnerable and vital weakness, not just on bodies, but in armed forces, organizations, or even civilizations. Kuprilaks believe that the only way the balance will ever be safe is by neutralizing high-up creatures of extreme alignment. This means that they're very good at taking out targets that are way, way more powerful than they are, kind of like the Lex Luthor to Superman. They seek out the kryptonite of their opponent and hit them right in the nads with it. So adventurers beware, these are beings that are not inexperienced at taking out demon lords. Few powerful humanoids from the Prime Material Plane pose them much of a challenge. Dungeon Masters should note that the stats for the Kuprilak are only a part of the equation. Their power is their knowledge and experience as well as access to things like diseases and poisons, spell scrolls, potions, wondrous technological items, artifacts and so on. When not otherwise disguised by their power to polymorph, Kuprilak appear to be slight and wiry humans with the easy grace and trim build of a half-elf or half-elf, but the coppery sheen of their skin and their featureless ruby-red eyes are a dead giveaway of their race. They have a very arrogant tone to their Rilmani stubbornness, but to be fair, their attitude stems from a professional pride. They are some of the best assassins on the plains and they know it. They not only use every trick in the book, they wrote the actual book on ruses, dirty tactics and subterfuge. It's said that nobody sees the Kuprilak before they strike, but they certainly see you. They are killers, not warriors. If there is a quick way to end a fight, they will always take it. If they can kill a target silently, out of sight, they will. If they do kill in full view before witnesses, it is usually for some other reason. So look for them doing this as a distraction as they take out the real target, while everyone else is paying attention to them. Kuprilax train with their ever-present pair of plus two copper-hued short swords and plus one throwing darts which return to them if they miss. They always attack first in a combat round. The Kuprilax speed and power in hand-to-hand -hand combat means they're just as deadly without weapons and are skilled assassins, so essentially they fight as high-level cross-class rogue monks with hands and feet as dangerous as magical weapons. They also have a range of spell-like abilities including light, darkness, hold monster, dispel magic, charm person, confusion, detect thoughts, see invisibility, innovation, etherealness, mind spike, modify memory, poison spray, and greater invisibility. Kuprilax can be damaged only by magic weapons of plus two or better. They also have the power to call in a brute squad of Feromac who teleport in and basically just lay waste to the area and anyone inside it, no questions asked. When Kuprilax aren't on the job, they are often pursuing rigorous training and driving themselves at a brutal pace or tearing up the spire in wild celebration. Other Rulmani just stay out of their way when the Kuprilax gather together and relax. The next sub-race, the Abiorak, are not the most impressive physical specimens among the Romani. They have a build much like a teenage human, but the resemblance ends as soon as you get close to them. Their name is inspired by the old name for Mercury, Quicksilver, thus the archaic Latin word for silver, Abies. Their role is essentially keeping tabs on the elemental inner planes, including the border elemental planes. As such, they have some pretty amazing abilities and techniques for travelling in extreme environments. 
They have a constant silver gleam surrounding them that shifts and contorts with every move they make, almost liquid in appearance. Their eyes have an even more obviously crystalline look to them, with that characteristic rainbow sheen. Less guarded than other Rulmani casts, Abiarachs are thought to be the most approachable of their kind. They can still be difficult to deal with, however, as their duties give them a fairly temperamental, stubborn outlook. They are far more used to viewing things from an elemental perspective than any other. Those who come from elemental worlds like Abia or serve primordial powers will tend to get along better with them, uh, particularly when the Abiarach is encountered away from Outland and they express more of their slight capriciousness. They keep a firm lid on this when they're back in Outland among their own kind though. When on missions to the inner plains, the Abiorax tend to travel in small bands and are typically on the move, watching for any signs of imbalance. Thanks to their abilities, they are occasionally found in the company of local elementals, serving as guides, guardians and or simply companions, as the elementals appreciate their headstrong and erratic attitude. Abiorax's are a lot stronger than they look, but are used to being outgunned by the elemental beings, so they have a habit of using guile and cunning rather than direct confrontation. And in combat, they move like martial artists, using their opponent's size and strength against them while staying in motion, taking opportunities to get quick and precise strikes that slow and weaken their opponent. They favour a reach weapon like a trident or a close combat weapon such as the elegant double-bladed demiloons. Abiorax's spell-like abilities include charm monster, comprehend languages, light, darkness, detect evil and good, detect magic, detect thoughts, feather fall, fairy fire, hold monster, invisibility, mirror image, polymorph, sanctuary, shocking grasp, teleport and tongues. They also have the innate power to kind of channel elemental power depending on which elemental plane they're on. So effects like move earth, gust of wind, wall of water and flaming sphere spells. Also, when an Abiorax is on the elemental plane, they gain immunity to the element of said plane as well as an affinity for the residents of that specific plane. For example, if an Abirak travels to the elemental plane of water, they gain total immunity to water-based effects and spells, and the friendship of the local water elementals, who see them as strange, but acceptable. Next, the tall and slender Argonac are named, again, after the Latin word for silver, Argentum. And they do indeed have a silvery sheen to their skin. They enhance this feature on the outlines by typically wearing white fabrics and clothing that suits their height. However, they typically serve as the advisors and agitators of the real Marni. They spend most of their time on the prime material plane where, when not apathetically observing, they use disguises to manipulate every conflict into a tie. Believe me, there are far more Argonact than anyone on the prime material plane knows and those who do, such as the Archmage Morden Kanan, tend to agree with their reasons with why they do what they do. I'll leave it up to you to decide for yourself how much you personally hate the Argonac. Argonacs are incredibly intelligent and resourceful. It is their chosen role to keep tabs on and decide their involvement in the affairs of the countless worlds on the Prime Material Plane. Well, I say countless, but the Argonacs know exactly how many worlds there are and where they are located in relation to each other, thanks to their free access to the Mirror Library. They have determined that the wars in the multiverse between the opposing forces of good and evil, law and chaos, will now be fought and won on the Prime Material Plane, rather than on the inner and outer planes, which is far more common in the multiverse's past. In the role as consummate information gatherers and grand strategists, their status is above all but the very rare and reclusives Oromax, whom the Argonax report to and answer directly to. The Oromax don't usually give them specific instructions though, they'll simply indicate a world on the Prime Material Plane and say, go deal with it. The Argonax will then carefully observe and assess the situation and make whatever adjustments are required to restore and maintain the almighty balance. This means they will take direct action to ensure no one side in any conflict gains a decisive upper hand. Let that sink in for a moment. The methods they use involve concealing their true identity, which is why so few on the Prime Material worlds know just how often the Romani engage in this activity, and I think it would become a shocking bit of news to those who are so used to the outer planner exemplars remaining in their realms and not getting directly involved in the affairs of Prime Material Plane people. But when you consider the actions of the real Marni, it starts to become clearer that they are also kept in a perpetual state of deadlock by the subtle actions of the exemplars of neutrality. So 
While the mortals and immortals alike may be outraged at this deliberately prolonging of conflicts and the horrific loss of life and resources caused by the duplicitous Romani, in the grand picture it's actually vital the Romani continue to keep the extreme powers of law and chaos without a firm foothold in the prime material plane, and as a byproduct, ensure that those individuals, cultures and species which engage in force to spread the ideologies or violence to secure resources end up paying dearly for it, even to the point of their own destruction. Of course, the thing that really outrages everyone is that the Romani don't care if those engaging in such violence are on the side of good or evil, and so depending on which side is gaining a clear upper hand, the Romani will always be on the side of the underdog, and the moment they shift the scales they will withdraw their secret advisors and covert agents, leaving the forces in a stalemate. Argonax avoid physical combat as much as they can, as this has a high risk of exposing their true nature. They will instead use their powers to charm, mentally dominate or bamboozle with illusion. If that fails and they are backed into a corner they will summon a wicked plus three wide-bladed broadsword or long-handled axe which they handle with ease due to their deceptively strong body, covered in silvery skin that is actually as thick and resilient as hide armour, so resistant to physical harm that only magic weapons of plus three enchantment or greater can even harm them. Argonax spell-like innate abilities are quite extensive, including a lot of enchantment and illusion. These include light, darkness, polymorph, detect good and evil, comprehend languages, tongues, detect magic, detect invisibility, dispel magic, hold the monster, greater invisibility, hallucinatory terrain, fly, mirror image, mass suggestion, command, wall of fire, prismatic spray, legend lore, identify, gash, cone of cold, heal, teleport and so on. Plus they have the power to gate in an assistant Argonaut or a squad of Freeramax if they need to. They have a unique form of attack which manifests as two rays of silvery light they shoot from their hands out to a range of 60 feet that has an energy type of the same as any the target happens to be weak to. They also have the ability to lay on their hands and heal their uh, whatever they're touching. As with all other Rulmani, the Argonax are able to travel to the astral plane or any of the outer planes or inner planes freely, but their access to the prime material plane is restricted. All Rulmani can only travel to the prime material plane if a creature of law or chaos of equal power is already present or is traveling there. So it often seems like the Rulmani rely on hitchhiking on the coattails of other planet creatures and can't plane shift of their own accord which is not the case, but they don't see a reason to correct others' mistaken assumption in that regard. Finally, we have the Oromac, the least numerous subrace and caste of the Romani. It's said that even the gods don't know exactly what they get up to. They rarely intervene personally, preferring to have their underlings do the work like anyone else in any sort of office. Incredibly rare, it's said that there are less than a hundred of them in all the Outland. They are named for the Latin word for gold, Aurum, and they do have clearly golden sheen to their skin. They're tall, athletic humanoids with beautific features and crystalline eyes that glow intensely with an energy that is too bright to look directly into. So most in their presence automatically lower their gaze, which is only fitting. This is magnified by an aura of power and peacefulness that surrounds them at all times. When situated near the spire, they dress in ornate but comfortable clothing that reflects their official duties. But if they travel beyond Outland, they will wear spectacular fluted golden plate armour and bear mighty vorpal swords or maces of disruption. Which is all the more impressive due to each aura at Mac being the size of an ogre. Due to them living deep in Rulmani territory, normally very close to the spire, very few non-Rulmani have ever seen them in person, and if they do, it will be when the Oromac are participating in one of their once-per-century gatherings, where other Rulmani will be clustered around them with a lot of activity going on. Though the Rulmani would be quick to correct the notion from an outside perspective, it seems very much like the Oromacs are the leaders of the Rulmani race, but really it's just that there are so few of them and their intellect is so highly valued that they are naturally extremely influential and highly regarded individuals. They lead by their merits and the respect of the members of their race. Their word is as good as law simply because what they say is always the right course of action to take from the Romani point of view. As organisers and influencers it's not their job to intervene personally and only the most exceptional circumstances would see them take a direct hand in the battle. If they do show up in a battle, it's fair to say that the custom would dictate that they are there to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with an overly troublesome demigod who just happens to keep willfully trying to mess up the cosmic balance. 
which the Oromac will take a professional opposition to. It's a stretch to say that they'd be personally upset. Their minds are just too busy for such trivial distractions as emotions. The Oromac will stride into combat like it's just another ceremony, very large, fabulous, with their glowing eyes beaming through the isolates in their crested helm, their large body thoroughly clad in highly decorated heavy plate armour composed of enchanted precious metals inset with gems and fine enamel artwork. They'll then materialise their heavy enchanted great sword and then, shockingly, spin into action with amazing speed and grace, far more agile than any human battlemaster. The Oromac will then amp up and weaponize their body halo into a destructive aura extending out to 15 feet from their body. Like the Argonac's silver hand rays, the golden aura will automatically inflict any energy type that their enemy is vulnerable to, and any hostile creature entering the area must make a wisdom saving throw or take fairly heavy damage. This golden aura also serves to shield the Oromac exactly like a globe of invulnerability, with the added bonus that it also protects from arrows and other missiles. The spell-like powers of the Oromax include light, darkness, polymorph, detect evil and good, comprehend languages, tongues, detect magic, detect invisibility, dispel magic, hold monster, cone of cold, prismatic spray, mirror image, command, suggestion, geish, cloud kill, all of the wall spells, slow, symbol, teleport, time stop, legend lore, heal, regeneration, greater restoration. Once per year they can also grant a wish. They can gate in a number of Argonax or Ferromax as required and they're almost invulnerable to harm as only weapons of a plus four or greater enchantment can damage them. Overall the Rulmani have no particular order, hierarchy or system of government but as mentioned the Oromax function as advisors and mentors to the entire race. Even though an Oromax isn't recognized as a king or an overlord their instructions are sufficient to make any lesser Rulmani leap to comply. Oromax leave the Outlands only to deal with the gravest of threats to the balance of the multiverse. So when they do, they're grave, remorseless, and coldly efficient. It's very highly advised that mortals stay well clear of them, because it is certain the Oromax will consider any mortal life forms completely expendable compared to the needs of the rest of reality itself. For the majority of Rilmani, they firmly believe that all people, all intelligent beings, are manifestations and representations of various aspects of the multiverse's desires and wants, and that by maintaining the balance, the multiverse can be kept sane, for lack of a better word. The various reflections of their own base essence can be kept in a careful relationship to one another and ensure that its continued existence can be a healthy one. As a result, Rilmani have some odd views on individuality and their own personal existence that can lead to deep confusion in conversation. The Rulmani language itself has no sense of first person. Everything is about the collective. All actions are viewed from an external perspective rather than a personal internal one. As a result, many have trouble with other languages because they can't use the magic of uh, comprehend languages or tongues when they're very close to the spire. This includes the location of the Great Mirror Library, so scholars who immerse themselves in the knowledge there have to learn all the different languages the hard way. When the Rulmani emerged from Outland and took their place at the base of the Spire after the departure and self-isolation of the Chimeral, they gained enormous knowledge of the Outer Plains that they quite honestly didn't really want, but compelled to explore the Outer Plains in Prime Material Worlds, they came to fully understand the peril the multiverse was in mainly in the lower plains with the eternal blood war raging, and in the upper plains where the Cardinals struggled to keep peace between the Archons and the Eladrin, while thousands of other worlds teetered on the brink of plunging back into the war between law and chaos. The genies in particular were always setting off some sort of conflict, plus the wicked Abolith had fallen, but the aberrant Elithids were slowly gaining in strength, sphere by sphere, and of course we've got the slowly creeping doom of the robotic clockwork horrors, and the enthralled races of the Elithids that went on to become the Githyanki and Githsarai, to name only two, aimless aside from the endless vendetta. There's so much upheaval in all directions. It was a terrifying time for the Romani beliefs, but they realised that any direct conflict would only spur the upheaval more. At the first Concordant which was held in short order after the discovery of the library, the Romani decided, while new, while unknown, they had the best chance at bringing about some stability to the plains quietly and undetected, but with a light touch here and there, it would require staying unknown, staying out of public notice. My final thoughts on the Rulmani, I find them a fascinating race, they are both methodically logical and also infuriatingly stubborn and uncompromising. 
They have appointed themselves the independent judges of the balance of powers in the multiverse. So they do tend to be very arrogant and take unilateral action against the wishes of all parties involved except themselves. Their assurances of their actions being for the greater good doesn't mean they are working for the powers associated with goodness. It can just mean the perpetuation of reality as we know it, warts and all. They're not out to fix the multiverse because they don't think that it's broken. They sit in one of the greatest treasures in the multiverse in the near infinite library of knowledge, but they do not share it with anyone else. Also, their civilization is based around the magic nullifying spire of the Outland, the center of reality, an incredibly secure location where even the gods can't bother the Romani. And yet, they remain a mostly passive force of observers, keeping tabs on the multiverse and also keeping very quiet on its deepest secrets. Please hit the like button if you made it this far, subscribe if you like what I do, check out my Subscribestar or Patreon for all the full scripts for these videos, buy some Teespring merchandise, wear your geek with pride, and as always, thanks for listening and I'll be back with more for you very soon. Thank you.